And I'm going to show you what they mean by hide the decline, because it's really fascinating. Here are the three data series from various tree rings that we're looking at. And there's one in green from a guy called Dr. Keith Griffer, one in red from Phil Jones at East Anglia, one in blue from Michael Mann, the lead author of the hockey stick graph paper, and then the actual temperatures just for the 20th century are in black, that zigzag on the right there. But look at where the green arrow is pointing. From 1960 until about 1985, the graph of Griffith's trees, the tree rings, shows that temperatures are supposed to be falling, and falling quite sharply, when in fact the black line tells us they were came down a little bit and then they rose very sharply. The other two data sets didn't go shooting up, they just went horizontal, but the, the temperature went shooting up. Now what that tells us is that tree rings are completely useless as a way of reconstructing <laughs> temperature. The whole basis for the hockey stick graph was bogus. So here you can see it more clearly. I've just shown you the before, which was the, the real data, with the black temperatures and in the real temperatures, and then you see after how they tampered with all three of those tree ring data sets to make it look as though the temperature was indeed tracking the tree rings accurately when in fact the tree rings had gone completely wrong. That is how bad and how notorious and how shameless they are at bending the science and then telling us that it's settled. Well, that raises the question, was there a medieval warm period? Well, more than a thousand scientists in more than 600 institutions in more than 40 countries in 25 years have contributed to papers in the peer-reviewed scientific literature, which established by a vast variety of what are called proxies, everything from portholes to tree rings to uh, sediments under lakes to foraminifera in the ocean, lots and lots of different ways. That the medieval warm period was real, was global, and was almost everywhere warmer than the present. So that's the truth of it, but you won't find that truth anywhere in any of the documents of the IPCC. So, from that we move briefly to the economic considerations. And this is where we're going to take, as an example, California's capital trade, carbon tax, that's what good is, kind of taxation. Now this is a worrying case study because it indicates sheer lunacy on the part of your legislators, and I'm going to make one exception before he hits me. <laughs> now, here are the, 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 what we call the case-specific input assumptions. Now what you've got is that the policy is due to run until 2020, and I'm going to assume it started in 2010, because that gives it a better chance to work than if you started in August this year. Now they were aiming by 2020, this is the official aim of the policy, to cut the carbon dioxide emissions of the state by 25%. Problem is that the emissions of California are only 8% of US emissions, which in turn are only 18.7% of global emissions. So the percentage of global emissions represented by the amount they're going to reduce it by is just 0.4% of global emissions. And this is why you start to see where this is going. We're not going to get that much global warming prevented, are we? If even if the scheme fully succeeds, only 0.4% of global emissions will be prevented. And this is an entirely uncontroversial figure. So now we do a little calculation using the IPCC's own methodology. And we find that sure enough, what would otherwise have been 413 parts per million by volume of CO2 concentration in the atmosphere in 2020 would fall to 412.9. <laughs> and that in turn means that the amount of warming that you would forestall, the amount of global cooling you would buy, at a cost, if you please, of $450 billion to you as taxpayers, would be one one thousandth of a Fahrenheit degree. Now, it's not for me to make a political assertion as to whether that is good value for your money or not. <laughs> as they say on Fox News, we report, you decide. <laughs> but of course, 
the other side may say, oh yes, but you see, California is showing leadership. <laughs> Fashion state leadership. We in California are showing leadership. We are destroying our economy and wrecking jobs and driving businesses into bankruptcy faster than anyone else. <laughs> What we want, we in California, is that everybody else should follow our leadership and do the same until the entire economic structure of mankind has been reduced to the state it's in in California. <laughs> That's their aim. So, okay, let's ride along with them and see what happens. If you apply globally the same measures that you are already applying or about to apply, here in California. And you'll be pleased to know that to forestall one Fahrenheit degree of warming will cost the world $454 trillion. It's quite expensive. Brian, I want you to stay up here. <laughs> you have to come up here. And your wife is going to come up with you. Give you courage. Come up here. And I want you to be the state. And your wife is going to be a dairy farmer. <laughs> because this was item number two that Norman Huck said. He said, you know, cows, they're all of a sudden going to become polluters in California. So here's the way it happened for you. First of all, as the state representative, he has a carving credit. Unless you think that this is not going to happen, the first carving credit auction is going to be held August the 15th. And there's a big document in the governor's budget that says $1 billion will be the net take from the August carbon auctions. $1 billion. That's one sixth of our budget deficit. If Sacramento finds out that this cash cow can be milked for a billion dollars every time they hold an auction, and as a king in the hose develops, and they become more expensive, then perhaps by the second carbon auction, which is scheduled for November 14th, it's going to double and be two million dollars. There are five scheduled for 2013, and they could increase in price, they could windfall, the state is expecting. Over here, Heather is the dairy farmer. And she's a profit making organization, so she has money. You'll notice the money is uh, slightly larger. It's uh, Obama money, it's <laughs> 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 Now, these carbon credits are being sold for $100 a piece. And of course, you want to keep your cows going, but you're aware, Heather, about your cows. <laughs> they seem to be burping methane <laughs> at both ends. <laughs> you have children just like that. <laughs> Unfortunately, the state doesn't sell commodities. So I'm going to have to handle the transaction with 
<laughs> so could you give me a round of just before I came over here to talk to you today, the gasoline people called me up and they offered me $200 for that burger. And then I got a call from the electric company and they offered me $300. So if you'd like to have that, it's going to cost you $500. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there you go. Great. And here's your carpet, right? So your house can keep on. Perfect. <laughs> oh, thank you. Here's your hundred dollars. <laughs> now you know how bad the trade. But this is America. There is a common sense, a down to earth, <coughs> which I always delight in when I come here. Your founding fathers did not intend that you should be governed as you are governed today. They intended that you should have a republic which was at root democratic. A republic that was free, a republic that was prosperous, a republic that was outward looking and generous to its neighbours. And I know, as one of your closest and most devoted allies, how often you have come to our aid in the United Kingdom when we have needed it. Against Hitler in the Second World War, against the Soviet Union in that long struggle for the freedom of the continent of Europe. And now, against the alien tyranny of medieval Islamicism, which is so unlike what the Prophet himself had intended. All of these, you have stood with us, and I pray that you will stand with us again in saying no to this international corruption that bids fair to bring down the West and bring down with it not just our economy, but also the very use of reason itself, which was the foundation of the West. We who were born in the age of reason and are now living in a dark age, wish to get back once again to the use of reason and not of prejudice in human affairs. For it is in reason that we are most unlike the rest of the visible creation. It is in reason that we are most like our Creator. It is to reason, then, that we must return the world. And I hope that the United States will stand with Britain once again and do just that. As I end with the words of Churchill to your President in the darkest hour before the dawn of freedom in the Second World War, from your poet Long. Sail on, O ship of state. Sail on, O union, strong and great. Humanity, with all its fears, with all the hopes of future years, is hanging breathless on thy fate. Thank you, and let freedom ring. people need a cause. How do we encourage them to fight pollution without demagoguing CO2? I'm going to amend the question. How do we get young people involved, in, first of all, interested, involved, and activated? Right. Young people on the whole these days are not joiners. The left have somehow managed to attract them. But on the whole, young people, just like us, are independent-minded, and therefore how do we get these independent minds 
to address these problems which we will leave behind. And it seems to me the best thing is to go back to the classical system of education. When I was a lad, and for every generation from the Middle Ages until I was a lad, I was the last generation to have this. Before we were allowed anywhere near the university, we were taught three things. We were taught grammar, a detailed knowledge of the workings of our own language, so that we could think straight. We were taught logic, so that we could understand the difference between real, proper, true reasoning and false reasoning. And then we were taught rhetoric, so that we could express our thoughts in various ways, not just in speeches, but also in poetry and in prose in various different forms. And until you had studied those three, you couldn't go to university. Now, the advantage of those three is that they parallel the three powers of the Christian soul, the memory, the understanding or the use of reason, and the will. These three topics were the initial formation and nourishment of the soul. And if we treat young people merely as though they were a commodity, to be pushed around into various tedious vocations, rather than as individual souls that need formation and nourishment, so that they can be directed into the right path. If we don't do that, then we will see precisely the degeneration of educational standards that is already depressingly evident in the public school system, and will spread into the private school system unless we are very careful. I'm afraid we've just got to accept that sometimes, as the Japanese have always understood instinctively, as have the traditional Chinese, the wisdom of our ancestors on these matters, particularly of education, is greater than our own. So back to a classical education for everyone, whether you like it or not.